Welcome to the 54th episode of our podcast series for advisors considering the independent space. Today's episode is how transparency propelled growth from one to four billion in eight years. A conversation with Paul Pagnato, CEO and founder of Pagnato Carp. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other podcast resources. If you're new to the series, I encourage you to visit diamond-consultants.com slash independence101 for the top five episodes that will help you get up to speed on the basics of the independent space, plus links to other episodes you may have missed. And if you're listening to the series on the Apple Podcast app, be sure to leave a star rating and review, as it serves as a guide for us, as well as your colleagues in the wealth management industry who may be searching for valuable content to tune into. The Forbes Top Wealth Advisors list represents what many advisors hope to aspire to, because to be included means you're part of an exclusive group that has achieved exceptional heights in the wealth management industry, a group that in total manages nearly a trillion dollars in client assets. But the qualifications to be recognized as a Forbes top advisor is not just about revenue and assets under management. A large part of the process that Forbes and Shook Research go through with advisor candidates is based on identifying those who best represent the highest quality amongst their peers. So in this episode, I'm honored to welcome one such advisor who Forbes recently ranked as number one in Virginia and number 29 in the nation. And this is not the first time he's made the list. It's actually the fourth consecutive year he's done so. It takes something very special to build a career and firm that continues to grow and achieve such honors. And that's why I'm excited to welcome Paul Pagnato, CEO and founder of Pagnato Carp, to share his story. And it's an interesting story indeed. Before becoming an advisor at Merrill Lynch, he was a microbiologist with NASA and McDonnell Douglas. Paul and his partner, David Carp left Merrill in 2011 to become one of the first teams to join Hightower Advisors, a firm which they would leave in 2016 to form their own fee-only RIA, Pagnato Carp. This employee-owned firm was founded on a set of principles based on what they call true fiduciary standards and rooted in transparency. Paul is passionate about the topic of transparency So much so, he's authored a book on the topic called The Transparency Wave, which will release in early 2020. Paul is a frequent media contributor to CNBC, The Wall Street Journal, Fox Business, Bloomberg, Reuters, CNN, and The Street, and also the founder of the True Fiduciary Institute, a nonprofit with the purpose to positively impact a million students. It's an incredible journey of passion driving growth. So I'm excited to talk with Paul about Pagnato Carp's unique value proposition and how it's impacted the firm's success, propelling it to over $4 billion in assets. Let's get to it. Paul, thank you so very much for joining me. My pleasure. Lots to talk about. Let's jump in. First of all, I want to congratulate you for making the Forbes list. It's an incredible honor, and I want to delve more into that later in the conversation. But first, would love it for perspective if you tell us a little bit about your professional background and history. You bet. Be delighted to. My professional background started as a scientist. So I have a degree in microbiology, and I worked on a project for NASA. And the project was to detect life in outer space. Well, after five years, guess what? We never found it. I think they're still looking. So completely changed careers and started my career in the financial industry with Merrill Lynch. Spent 19 fabulous years there, had amazing mentors, was uh, one of the best learning experiences of my life. And then from there, I decided to be more of an entrepreneur and uh, was a partner with Hightower three years after that, uh, set up our own company. Yeah. And we'll get more into each, uh, unpack more of those pieces, but 
How do you go from being a scientist to a financial advisor? What was the pull to Merrill Lynch at that time? Well, my next door neighbor was a manager for Merrill Lynch. And I was just at a point in time in my life where I was searching to switch careers and, and do something differently. And he was explaining to me, being a, an advisor, you're coaching, counseling, helping people with one of the most important aspects of their life, their financial well-being. And also was explained to me that it's like running your own business. You have your own clients you work with. You have to... Uh, create your own marketing initiatives and strategies and do your own financial planning. And it just really got me excited to be more of an entrepreneur. So that's how all that happened. Clearly, you owe that man a debt of gratitude because (laughs) you've had an extraordinary career since then. Tell us a little bit about Pagnato Corp. So how many on the staff, how many partners, how many advisors, how many support staff? What does it look like? Yeah, so there's two partners, myself and David Karp. We've been partners now for over 20 years. The support staff, we really, we're all team members. Everyone's referred to a team member, and that's very important to me from a cultural standpoint. But there's about 35 team members, and most of the individuals are advisors. So we have seven relationship managers individuals that are the main point of contact for clients. But then we have CPAs, attorneys, a lot of CFPs, a lot of planners, uh, Dr. Orlando. Uh, So it's really a very advisory-based family office. And how does the makeup of the firm differ today from when you first started the business, whether it be the makeup of the team under Hightower or the makeup of when you first launched Pagnato Carp as an RIA? So when I started in the business, I was a sole proprietor, and one of my coaches early on uh, was Dan Sullivan, and he taught me this concept of unique ability, and that's everybody on the planet has a God-given talent. There are 7 billion people on the planet, and there are things many that you can do I'll never be able to do as well, and there are things I can do you'll never be able to do as well. And so what I've done over the last 27 years with Merrill and Hightower and Independent is really um, continuously year after year strip away things that aren't in line with my unique ability and bring on people, A players, top, top talent, pay them very, very well. And people that have unique abilities in areas that are going to create unbelievable experiences for our clients. And who are those clients? What do they look like? So our clients are CEO founders of businesses. 90, 95% are privately held companies, and we help them with the life cycle. Generally, they're referred to us 12 to 24 months before an event, and we, we get them ready before they go through a liquidity event. Our minimum is $10 million of investable assets. So they tend to have $10 million to three, $400 million in investable assets, but they're CEO founders. And the CEO founders are entrepreneurs and they have a really specific DNA and our entire organization is structured and geared to add value to them. Extraordinary. How much were you managing just out of curiosity when you left Merrill? in 2010? Great question. So we had about $900 billion in assets under management and then about $200 million in liabilities. So between assets and liabilities, a little over a billion dollars. Extraordinary. So you've grown to X and no wonder Forbes acknowledged it. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit in terms of how you got there and what you think is most attributable to that. But with a billion dollar business at Merrill, And a long runway, meaning, you know, a long career ahead of you, you were relatively young. What made you and David Karp become interested in independence, especially because nine years ago or a decade ago, independence wasn't nearly as mainstream as it is today? It was a couple things. One of the major triggers was the financial crisis. That was a life-changing experience for me, as it was for a lot of people globally. I never wanted to be faced with the situation where I couldn't look a client in the eye and give them complete confidence that their assets are completely safe. 
during a financial crisis, you know, we're very, very levered. You know, at the time, there's 10,000 banks. Today, we have 6,000 banks. So 4,000 banks have closed shop. You had the biggest automobile manufacturer, General Motors, went bankrupt. The government had to step in and, and take them over to the biggest mortgage company in the world, to the largest brokerage firm in the world. And our clients' assets were no longer safe. And these are individuals that are trusting me for their financial independence, their children and their children's children. And I never wanted to put our clients in that situation again. I never wanted to be in that situation. I never want to put my team in that situation. So we vowed to fix that. And then the second thing is value creation. We found that the independent space serving CEO founders we were able able to unleash more value for our clients. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what sort of value do you think you were able to unleash in the independent space and why was it necessarily value that you couldn't unleash as an employee at Merrill Lynch or elsewhere? Yeah. So again, I did have an amazing 19 years at my prior firm and wouldn't be where we are today with without that company and all the fabulous mentors. But the differences were, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you're fully independent, you have access to the entire world, not just the firm that you're employed by. Also, by being a a true fiduciary and pulling away from having an affiliation with a broker dealer from a compliance and regulatory standpoint, we were freed up to do and take on more family office type functions than we were permitted before. So our concierge and lifestyle services just, it's a 10x offering now compared to where it was before. Being able to not just do tax planning, but now actually offer tax advice, do tax compliance, tax returns for individuals. To be able to help clients not just perform their estate plan, but to have it all under one roof where it's seamless for their estate planning documents wills and trust to to be created. So it's just a whole plethora of new value creation items to private investments that we didn't have access to before, boutique, smaller private investments to the reporting capabilities. It's really spectacular. And what about the sort of midway stop to Hightower? Just for perspective for our listening audience, Hightower has certainly changed its stripes in the last decade. When Hightower was first launched, it was a partnership model, and that is what you joined, where their whole focus was on recruiting corner office wirehouse teams that were going to be what we call quasi-independent. They were going to be employees, but have the look and feel of independence with the ability to really shop the street, as you call it, the world is their oyster, and get paid a percentage of trailing. 12 months production in cash and equity in Hightower. We just had Bob Oros on, the new leader of Hightower, and our last episode, and he talked a lot about Hightower 2.0. But in the Hightower 1.0 iteration, what was it about that model of quasi-independence that appealed to you? Yep. And by the way, I'm a huge fan of Bob Oros. He's one of my best friends, and I applaud Hightower They're very, very fortunate to have Bob and his team on board. So I know he's already doing great things and the best is yet to come. So the Hightower 1.0 with uh, Elliot uh, Weisbluth and and Drew, founders of Hightower, they really did something very special and very unique. They created a, a roadmap and a path for advisors that were employed by a broker dealer or a bank to be able to unleash their unique ability and to be entrepreneurs. And they did it fabulously. So when my partner, David Karp, and I had to make the decision, do we just take the leap and create our own RIA and be independent on our own or have a firm like Hightower help us? It was a no-brainer because we did not want to learn because there's so many nuances in setting up your own firm and launching our own RIA. We did not want to learn on our client's dime. So Hightower was invaluable in helping us get from point A to point B. Yeah. And I think that's a similar move that a lot of people or a similar calculus that a lot of folks went through for a couple of reasons. One, the cottage industry born to support the breakaway movement wasn't nearly what it was today, 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, if you had gone fully independent, the learning curve and the amount of time and energy it would have taken to pull together the support infrastructure you would have needed would have been far greater than today. Secondly, I think that 
whether people love or hate Hightower, and I happen to be a big fan, but we absolutely must credit Hightower for being a maverick and really paving the way for this breakaway movement because it normalized it, it validated it. It was really the first time, and whether that be driven by the financial crisis or otherwise, that a firm really began to choose that even though it had an unknown name, an unrecognizable name, that if advisors could access everything that they could in the wirehouse world, but do it in an environment with more freedom and control, they would move. And hence, High Tower's tremendous success in High Tower 1.0. Agreed. Incredibly innovative. It took a lot of courage, a lot of leadership to get that off the ground. But they really were the, were the first. And I applaud Elliot and company for that. Yep. So fast forward then to the time you decided to leave Hightower. And I know you left on incredibly good terms. As you say, you still have tremendous respect for the firm and its leaders. So what went into that decision and what was the independent landscape looking like at the time that you left in terms of pulling together the support to build Pagnato Corp as an RIA? Yeah, so the landscape in that five-year period that we were with Hightower changed dramatically. You know, we're in this exponential period as a society, and the technological advances that took place in the RIA space from reporting, from custody, from access to all the things that we do on the family office side, literally those exponentials, a 10 times difference. That made it easier for us to set up our own, our own RIA. But more importantly than that, it was really a, a strong desire of my partner and I to own our own firm. I grew up the son of an entrepreneur, and it was just always a dream that I had was to, to own our own business. So it was multiple reasons that we really set a different path to create our own firm. And when you left Merrill, to go to Hightower, just to backstep a second. Did you know that you wanted something more entrepreneurial? Were you looking to get closer to being an entrepreneur, a business owner at that time? Or were you also exploring traditional models like maybe Morgan Stanley or UBS or Raymond James or something like that? Super question. So we explored the entire landscape. At the the end of the day, I'm a scientist and I do tons of experiments and tons of due diligence. So we, we met with all the large banks, all the large brokerage firms, as well as the independent space. It was very clear that to provide complete transparency to our clients, to be able to be a true fiduciary and to unleash more value, we had to go on the independent space. Coupled with the passion of unleashing our unique abilities and being an entrepreneur, it was a no-brainer for us to go you know, on the independent space. But we did a thorough assessment on both sides. So let me just focus on that for a second, because I think a lot of advisors in your shoes, first of all, not everyone has as much entrepreneurial genetic DNA as you might, but there were plenty of people that sort of are at that threshold, feeling the pain and limitations of being an employee at a major firm, wanting more freedom, flexibility, control, some of the things that independence or quasi-independence offers, but finding it really hard to emotionally and financially give up the safety and security of a large transition deal up front transition economics up front, and the safety and security and scaffolding of being an employee of a big brand name firm. So how did you reconcile that? It's passion. It's belief and wanting to make an impact. I believe to put purpose over profits, you need to be that way. So whether it's you're you're at that point in time of your life, or it's just part of who you are. And and it's awesome to be profits-based as well. We live in a capitalist system and society here, and it rewards those that that are. I fully respect that. But the reality is to be a true fiduciary, to forego many, many revenue sources that exist on the bank and broker-dealer side, you take a pay cut. So my partner and I, we took a 50% pay cut when we made that transition to being a pure true fiduciary. So it, you know, it took time to get back to where we were when we left off. So I believe for an individual to do that and to take a pay cut, I mean, we were an extreme going complete true fiduciary, cold turkey, 
But even to take a 25% pay cut is very, very substantial, and it has to be purpose-based. Yes, purpose-based, but confident, but a certain amount of risk tolerance, a sort of visionary kind of mentality, the ability to sort of see what's possible, trusting, right? I mean, all of those things have to be true as well, and a certain amount entrepreneurial as well. Totally. In addition to uh, wanting to, to make a difference in the impact, you do have to be good with yourself. You do have to have confidence that it's going to work out. You have to have faith. It's not linear. We're linear creatures as opposed to exponential creatures. So it, it's not a linear line from point A to point B. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And when you have uncertainty, it breeds fear. But you have to have confidence. Purpose has to be there. And it's the journey as humans, we love to explore and we love to discover. And this is one of the best discoveries I've ever made. You know, I think what's interesting is what as sort of an industry consultant, one of the observations I've made is that it's been a re-education for advisors. So when I started this business as a recruiter for wealth advisors 21 years ago, the only way an advisor moved and the biggest motivation for doing so was because he was going to get a big transition check or signing bonus going from one major firm to another. But the re-education has come in into teaching advisors that or helping them to see that an advisor has the ability, can really decide what's most important to them. Some are really excited about building something big picture, building equity, building a legacy, et cetera, and are are willing to forgo the short-term upside for something much bigger. And many others are much more comfortable with taking, de-risking a move as much as they possibly can in the short term. And the big picture or long term is less important. The re-education comes in the fact that today there's options that didn't really exist 21 years ago and actually listed, existed much less 10 years ago when you, or nine years ago when you left Merrill Lynch because independence was much less mainstream then than it is now. Yep. And I believe this is becoming more mainstream for society. You have the gig economy, which is the fastest growing part of the economy. Stanford is completing a study called Map of Life. And the reality is individuals today are going to school, they have a career, and they go back to school, they have another career. And there's many, many iterations of this. And the beautiful thing of the wealth management space is you're able to continue to do that within the same ecosystem. So going from a broker dealer, a bank to independent, and then there's so many iterations of independence you're able to continually reinvent yourself and continually learn and continually grow. It's just an awesome career path for somebody today. For the right person, of course. So when you think back to the break from Hightower and decision to establish Pagnato Carp as a standalone RIA, I'd love to hear a little bit about your process for getting there, from getting from Hightower to fully independent, because it meant unplugging from all of the vendor relationships or the omnibus plug-in that you had to Hightower. You had to source capital. You had to be guided by expertise and counsel. You needed operational support and tech support and the like. So where did all that come from? Well, it starts with transparency. Because transparency changes everything. So we were completely open and transparent with uh, our partner, Hightower, what our dreams and aspirations were. And, you know, it took time, but after... Uh, transparently having these dialogues that we amicably uh, determined a path for us to be able to do that. It was important to us and, and clearly the other partners at Hightower for us to make them completely whole for, for everything and all the work and the value they created for us. So it started with complete transparency. And then once we had that transparency, and we were all aligned, then it was it was made it much, much easier to work with our other partners. So whether it's the custodian, whether it's on the reporting side, 
whether it's firms that we have uh, capital with on the asset management side. Then it just, it all came together uh, rather efficiently and quickly. But it's also a big change going from being employed somewhere like Hightower and being a partner to having your own firm. So now you're responsible for your own human resources. You're responsible for, you know, we're 100% employee owned. So you're responsible for figuring out your own equity distribution amongst your, your company. You're responsible for payroll, taxes. You're responsible for your own benefits. There's, there's so much, your, your facilities, your lease, your property. So there's a lot that goes into having your own RIA. That was a transition and that was a, another learning experience, which we just thrive. So we, we love learning all that and discovering all that and figuring all that out. But Hightower was a phenomenal partner for us to get from point A to point B. And where did the startup capital come from for you to build Pagnato Car? Yeah, so it was two sources. It was personal savings from myself and David Carp. And then uh, we also established a line of credit with a bank. And in hindsight, do you think that you could have gone fully independent, become a standalone fee-only RIA, having left Merrill? Or do you feel like the interim stop at Hightower taught you or gave you certain skills or education that you needed in order to get here today? So could we have? We could have. There's individuals that do it, and like the Luminous Capital folks uh, that, that did it, uh, Mark Sear, I'm good friends with, and Saffron and, and David Hogue, but they did it amazingly successfully. So could we have, we could have, but no desire to do that. And it would have been too challenging for us to figure all that out right out of the gate. Yeah, too big a leap. Yeah, too big of a leap for us. Yeah, Yeah. especially in those days. So just to be clear for our listening audience, the Luminous Capital, Mark Sear and David Ho, that Paul just referenced, is a group of Merrill Lynch advisors that themselves were mavericks. They left Merrill Lynch to go full-on RIA. They hired a COO by the name of Matt Sonnen, who's now a consultant to the industry, but he really built the firm for them. And they built an extraordinary firm that they later sold to First Republic for more than $100 million. And then actually recently, the team split apart, broke away from First Republic and went fully independent again. So they've really come full circle. But in those days, it was especially unusual. There was no validation, no well-worn path for billion-dollar teams to leave the confines of the wirehouse world and go independent. So in the last decade, not only have you learned a lot, whether it be because of your time at Hightower, but it's also the industry landscape has sort of had proof of concept and the support system has really evolved to support it. For sure. It's completely different. Again, it's an exponential difference five years, 10 years ago versus today. And it's just going to get better and better and more and more efficient because of technology. Yeah. How did your clients respond, Paul, when you left Merrill? And not just about the move to Hightower, but explaining what independence was and explaining who Hightower was, which was a firm nobody had ever heard of. How did they respond and what was the picture you painted for them? Super question. So number one, we explained to them that it was all about them, that we were doing this for them. We were doing it to be able to provide more transparency for them, to be able to be a true fiduciary and to be able to add more value. So once we were able to articulate why we were making the transition and the clients realized that it was really about them and also be able to add more value to them, it became an easy conversation. And we were very fortunate. We had 90% of our clients moved with us to, uh, to independent to Hightower. So a very, very high success rate there. But it's all about the client and you always need to put clients first. If you do do a transition and the transition is focused on the client and the additional value you're going to create for the client, the rest of things take care of themselves. Yeah. So you use the word fiduciary a lot, and I want to just unpack it for a second. So many wirehouse advisors think of themselves as fiduciaries. They would never dream of taking an action or making a decision that didn't put their client's best interests first, even though the 
the brokerage model says they're only held to the suitability standard. So in your mind or in your view, how is your version of being a fiduciary different than the fiduciary mindset of being a wirehouse advisor? It's completely different. Now, when I was at a broker dealer, I felt I was a, being a fiduciary. I felt like I was always putting my clients' interests first. And until it's like, until you get up on a bike and ride it, you don't really know what it's like. So now being a true fiduciary, we know what it's like. And it's impossible for somebody who works at a bank, a broker dealer to be a true, a true fiduciary. You uh, simply don't have access to everything to always put your client's interests first. It could be something simple as where you place your client's cash right? You, you may be beholden to the firm's money market account versus exploring even, even where the assets are custodied. It may not be in the client's best interest to be custodied at the firm you're employed by because there may be another custodian that is a better fit for your client. So as we define true fiduciary, it's impossible to be a true fiduciary. Now, some of my best friends are some of the top advisors in the country uh, at banks and broker dealers, and I personally trust them implicitly and would entrust them with with my capital. So they are looking out for their clients and they're always doing everything they can to put their clients' best interests first, but it's not always possible. Yeah. One of the things that I think is true is that once you see, you can't unsee. So in a lot of cases, when wirehouse advisors begin to explore independence and they begin to see and realize that there is access to things in another world that aren't possible to be accessed or offered as an employee of a brokerage firm, it's not that these folks are knowingly not acting in a fiduciary capacity. They just don't know any better. But for those that get educated, once you know, it's impossible to unknow. That's beautifully said. My business partner and I, when we went through this learning experience and exploring during the financial crisis, exploring what was available, once we knew that there was a better way, there was no going back. Yeah. And how about the decision in your case to jettison the broker-dealer licenses altogether and become fee-only, which is what Pagnato Carp is today? So it was quite an experience because that's not the norm. We had some capital with mutual funds and annuities. We had uh, capital with insurance products. And literally, we had to call them and explain to them that we can no longer receive any trails, any of the things that, that are just standard in the industry. And when we reached out to them, they were dumbfounded. They're like, what do we do? They didn't even know how to handle that. So it was quite an experience because the industry just isn't set up for that. We figured it out because following our true fiduciary standards, we're prohibited from receiving those things. So it was quite a, a learning experience. And it was hard to unwind those things because you're working with major institutions, major financial companies and firms that have their systems and processes structured and set up in a certain way. And we're telling them, no, you can't pay us that way and you can't send us that money. I mean, they were just... They'd never even heard that before. <laughs> so we figured it out, though. What was the driver for you and David to give up brokerage business altogether and become fee-only? The financial crisis, we spent three years doing due due diligence, met with all the SEC commissioners. I developed close personal relations with Phyllis Borzi at the time, was really overseeing the DOL, the, uh, all the retirement plans. I spent time with John Mack, CEO of Morgan Stanley at the time, Todd Thompson, the CFO of City. And after three years of deep, deep work, deep due diligence, we crafted 10 transparency standards, 10 standards to do everything that we could in our power to remove the conflicts of interest. And these were some of the conflicts of interest. So we did not want to receive any soft dollar arrangements. We did not want any revenue share. 
because then we would be conflicted in placing clients' capital there. So that was the root of it, is we created these 10 transparency standards. We call it true fiduciary standards. And we live and breathe by it. And it's the DNA. It's ingrained into the culture of our company. And that is one of our, we have two major breakthrough value propositions. One of them is the true fiduciary standards. And the second is our family office. So would you mind sharing with us a little what some of those 10 principles are and what they actually mean to clients? You bet. The root of what they mean is always placing their interest first, number one. And then number two, it's safety of assets. So, you know, as we dissected the financial crisis, one of the things that it was startling to us was the Bernie Madoff situation. And I know there's been case studies done on that. But if you think about the Bernie Madoff situation, Bernie Madoff, and this ties many right into a lot of the true fiduciary standards that we've created. If you think of the Bernie Madoff situation, Bernie Madoff never got caught by the SEC, literally absconded and people lost over $60 billion. And you ask yourself, how is that possible? How did the SEC never catch them? And how did very, very sophisticated investors you know, former CEO of Merrill Lynch had capital with them, David Kamansky, Elliot Spitzer, the New York attorney general had capital with them to the owners of the New York Mets. Like how in the world did this happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. It happened because Bernie Madoff was allowed and permitted to generate client statements and be the advisor. Bernie Madoff was permitted to be the custodian and the advisor for the client assets. So people wrote checks to Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff was able to calculate his own client performance returns and numbers. Bernie Madoff was allowed to have revenue share. Bernie Madoff was allowed to accept commissions and a whole host of other things. And all those things that he did are still allowed today. But this is the root as to why he got away with this for 20 years, never got caught by the regulators, and turned himself in. And he got he had to turn himself in because of the financial crisis, because of all the capital that was lost. So the standards that we have don't allow for those things to occur. So we're not allowed to be a custodian and accept dollars because we feel that's a conflict of interest. We're not allowed to generate client statements We believe if you're the advisor and generate client statement, you're potentially putting yourself in a precarious situation. We're not allowed to calculate client performance numbers. There's a whole host of ways to calculate performance numbers for clients, time-weighted, dollar-weighted, when your starting point is, when your ending point is. And, you know, as an advisor, you want to look good in front of your client. So we take that off the table and we remove that. So these are some examples of these 10 standards that we've put in place and why we put those in place. And I'm really passionate that one day these will become standards for the industry because people will demand it because they don't want to have their capital with someone that could potentially be a Bernie Madoff. You're in the process, I know, of releasing a book called The Transparency Wave. So I assume that will be a piece of the impetus to move the industry in that direction. It will be a part of it, for sure. But what I've learned is these principles apply to all businesses in all industries. It's not just the industry that you and I work in, Mindy, that struggle with this. All industries do. So I've actually created... uh, six steps. I call it the six T's of transparency. And if a firm follows these these six T's of transparency, they will be exponentially transparent. And when you're exponentially transparent, you have the ultimate trust. That's at the end of the day, what any company, any advisor wants to have with, uh, with their clients. Yeah. You know, I think for most advisors, coming to the notion of being fee only is an evolution. And it sounds like it was like that for you as well. 
you give up being a scientist, you go to work for Merrill Lynch, you're working for a brokerage firm at the time, and then what became bank-owned. Hightower was a broker-dealer and an RIA, and it sounds like there was a real evolution in your thinking, whether it be driven by the financial crisis or watching events unfold around Bertie Madoff and the like that sort of brought you to this impassioned belief about being a true fiduciary and uh, fee only. You got it. And just as I have had, I was fortunate to make this evolution over almost three decades now, 27 years, people, not just our industry, but society is doing the same. And this is part of, you know, sorry to go back to the book again, but this is part of the book, Transparency Wave. So what's happening is you go back hundreds of years ago, the really the first thing that occurred was the communication period. You had the printing press, the combustion engine, the airplane, and that enabled human beings to provide dialogue and transparency at a new level. And that brought us to the digital era that we're all living in today. And now the digital era is getting so advanced with machine learning, artificial intelligence, there's nowhere to hide. And so this is kicking us into the transparency wave. And it's going to be very, very prevalent to the wealth management space, the financial industry, but all industries. So just as I've personally been fortunate to experience the transition and to be able to evolve and change, so are all the other industries and the rest of our peers. And it is paramount to be ahead of the curve. It is paramount to take advantage of the opportunities and that, that technology is serving up to us. You want to ride that wave. You don't want to be in the middle or the bottom of that wave. You want to ride that wave because things are changing at a very, very fast pace. As you had mentioned, things are so different today than they were five years ago, than they were 10 years ago. And the reality is the speed of that change is accelerating. It's not slowing down. So it's really important for us to continually reinvent ourselves as advisors, as wealth managers, as managing our, our clients, managing our book of business and embrace the technology and embrace these changes that are taking place. That's a good segue for my next question. So clearly, you and David and Pagnato Carp as a firm have been at the forefront of this wave, have embraced change, have used it to your advantage. So what role do you think that, one, your value proposition of being a true fiduciary and fully independent has played in that growth? And what's really most responsible for that extraordinary growth? So number one, it's, it's our team and our brand that has led to it. So the team are all owners of the business. Everybody is equity. If you came on board our company, day one, you're going to receive units uh, or a partnership in the business. You feel like a team member from day one. The transparency standards just, you feel good every day. You feel so proud. Like you, you just jump getting out of bed to make a difference and to go help people because you know you're always doing the right thing and all those conflicts are are being put aside. And then you put on top of that our insatiable learning as a company. So we have, in fact, today is a learning day for our company. Every month we have learning day. And the learning day, the team determines what they want to learn. We've had top neuroscientists come in, top nutritionists. We've had people from Dale Carnegie come in. So today someone's teaching uh, white glove service. Not that we don't know what it's like to have white glove service, but we put our ego aside and we want to learn more and we want to grow more. So it's having a culture that embraces learning and change and growing. Our company, everyone's expected to experiment every quarter. So we have like eight, nine different areas in the company. Each area has three to four experiments. So every quarter we have 30 to four experiments going on. The reality is the majority of those experiments are going to fail. But I have 30, 40 experiments. All we're looking for is one or two or three to work. And then that's new value creation for our clients. And we do this quarter in, quarter out, year in, year out. So it's a never-ending process of our ability to just continually add more and more value to our clients. So it's the culture, and I'm sensitive to use that word culture because it's so overused. 
I was fortunate to have dinner with Howard Schultz, the CEO founder of Starbucks. And that was a big deal having dinner with him. So, you know, I thought I did all the research I, I could do and really planned, you know, what questions I was going to ask him. And I was thinking, you know, I want to know what keeps Howard Schultz up at night. You know, is it like getting coffee beans from Columbia? <laughs> like, what is it? And that was my first question to him. And when I asked him, he didn't skip a beat. And we spent an hour talking about culture. That's what keeps him up at night. It's the people. A business is the people. And it's only worth the people that that comprise it. And then if you have the right people and you have the right culture and you have the right standards that, that are in place, then you get the brand, the brand recognition. I mean, then we have people every month that are contacting us. They find us on the internet through SEO searches. They're contacting us because they want to work with a true fiduciary. They want to work with an uber transparent organization. They want a family office. And that's that's our brand. That's our brand out in the marketplace. So that's um, I just feel so passionate about those items. You talked about concierge level services and these 10 points of transparency, but what are some tangible examples of how that culture within the firm translates to a better experience for clients, which ultimately translates to more growth? Sure. On the concierge and lifestyle uh, piece, we, um, you know, we're, it's very, the norm in the travel industry is uh, revenue share. That's how uh, a lot of travel agents make their money and their, and their compensation. We're forbidden from doing that because it's violated true fiduciary standards. So our travel experts, they're planning a trip for someone. They're stripping out all the costs. So there is a delta there when you're not going to receive any benefit. And it could be that the hotel they stay at now is comping them a free breakfast or a free or a free dinner. So we're able to reduce the costs and simplify their lives on the lifestyle. That's one example. An experiment that our private bankers who take care of all the banking and all the admin for our clients did is it's very cumbersome dealing with all the paperwork that exists in our industry. And so an experiment was to completely go to DocuSign, e-signature for, for paperwork. And after a quarter and piloting it, we're there. So our clients now can have everything seamlessly through uh, electronic signature. Uh, on the tax side, with tax compliance, uh, we now utilize new technology that completely streamlines the tax efficiency for our clients. So they spend half, our clients have to spend half the amount of time they used to spend in uh, working with our CPA and getting ready for the tax season. So all areas of the business are relentlessly experimenting and pursuing these things. And when you strip out the conflicts, when you strip out the ability to think about or potentially receive any kind of revenue share, all that drops to the bottom line of a client. Yeah, and I suppose that clients sense that prospects sense that even if you don't give them tangible examples of it, people really know when you're all about what's in their best interest versus having to meet the needs or deliver to the needs of a corporate parent. That's exactly right. People are smart. People's brains are processing so fast, right? There's not a computer today that's ever been built that can process at the speed that a human brain can. So they're taking in, you know, thousands of pieces of information every second. That's, you know, how we form our opinions and thoughts and views, and sometimes we'll call it our, our gut, our gut reaction. So individuals are very sharp, they're very intuitive, and they know, and it does, it does make a difference. Yeah, and I agree with you, the word culture is an overrated, overused term. But I think that what a client or prospect responds to is culture more than anything else. They respond to a certain feeling of this is what it's going to feel like to work for this firm, as opposed to this is what it's going to feel like to work with this other firm or to work with this other advisor. Yeah, 
when someone is referred to you or someone contacts you and they come in and you're able to communicate to them that the only source of revenue the firm receives are the advisory fees you pay. We have no agenda, no agenda, but to do the right thing for you. We have nothing to sell you, but provide you our advice. That really knocks down barriers and walls and really gets you aligned very, very quickly with the client. Yeah. So on the subject of growth, what does growth look like in the future for Pagnato Carp? What are some of the growth goals in the short term and long term? So we have very ambitious goals because we have an MTP, a massive transformational purpose of positively impacting a million lives through financial well-being. So we are just getting started and we have a tremendous amount of work to do on all fronts. So our growth has been accelerating. Traditionally, we've grown uh, 20% a year. That's just been been in our DNA. But now that our brand awareness is uh, becoming more prevalent, we're ticking up above the 20% growth. So we're super, super excited about that. We've also only grown organically. Uh, I'm very, very proud of that. So we don't have any plans to grow inorganically, which would be acquiring other other practices. At this point in time, we still plan on uh, growing organically and putting our our capital, you know, our human capital and our financial capital, deploying that back in the business as investments to further push out our value proposition through transparency and the true fiduciary standards and through our offering with our family office. And so what do your succession plans look like, your continuity plans for you and David and the next generation? As I look back 10 years ago, David and I were the only relationship managers for our clients. Today we have seven. So as we continue to grow organically, the transition will be from David and I to the other team members. This has already taken place. You know, at one point in time, I was a relationship manager like David, uh, and it's been three, four years since I've managed a relationship. So I've successfully transitioned the relationships I had to other relationship managers. David, five years ago, he had twice the amount of relationships that he was managing that he manages today. So he has also successfully transitioned the relationships to other relationship managers. So this is the cycle of a business. This is the cycle of life, you know, seeking the flourishing of others and helping others. So our succession plan is to continue doing what we've done really well and bring other like-minded impact-based individuals and uh, help them grow, help them learn, mentor, coach them, and continue to seek their flourishing, which benefits everybody. And do you imagine that if you or they, this next generation of relationship managers, wanted to either bring in more capital or sell a portion of the business or sell the whole business, do you imagine that the right buyer would exist? It's a super good question. So number one, our true fiduciary standards would need to be upheld before we would consider that. Whoever that buyer would be, whatever they'd look like, they would need to fulfill and allow the company to continue to abide by these these 10 standards. First and foremost, I have majority ownership of the business and I'll never let go of that unless those 10 standards are going to be withheld. But if there is someone out there that embraces these 10 standards and has a platform that would enable us to accelerate uh, getting to the in- impacting a million lives, we'd be more than open to having a dialogue. It's all it's all about seeking the flourishing of others and, and making a bigger difference. So if that opportunity existed, uh, yeah, I'd welcome that dialogue. You know, life is a journey and things change every day, every week, every month, every year. So we'll see where it takes us, but it has to be in line with the, the 10 standards, which is really, really super difficult. <laughs> you need to have congruent values. That's your most important threshold to meet. And then then beyond that, it has to meet all the same service models and everything else. So not so easy, but just curious, asking you to sort of predict the future. A couple of last questions, and again, I could do this all day because I think your story is such an interesting one. The evolution of your career, the evolution of your business, the growth of your business, and the success of it all. But 
you mentioned that you've given up all client management responsibilities at this point. So what does a typical day look like for you? How do you spend most of your time? Well, I'm going to first like admit and acknowledge I suffer from PMA, positive mental attitude. So I uh, literally, uh, the glass is not just half full for me, it's all the way full. And that can be good and bad. So every day I wake up, I'm jumping out of bed and it's positivity, positivity. The second is I have the transparency plague. So I am just uber transparent all the time about everything. Sometimes that can make people uncomfortable. But for me, it's about making a huge, huge impact and getting us to our MTP. So I spent time, it's been two years in writing the book. For those listeners that uh, have written a book, you know what that's like. That's a full-time job in and of itself. So there'll be a lot of speaking engagements next year as the book rolls out. Secondly, launched two years ago, the True Fiduciary Institute. It's a nonprofit, a 501c3. And uh, we now, I've partnered with 10 major universities these are institutions like Penn State, University of Georgia, uh, Florida Atlantic University, UVA, William & Mary. And uh, we are doing a couple things, but we're teaching financial literacy through wealth management programs at the schools. So spending a lot of time and energy on that, continually recruiting A players, just top, top talent for our organization. And I'm a mentor and a coach to the existing team members to uh, when they hit a ceiling of complexity, when they have barriers in front of them, I do everything I can to help them pierce through that ceiling of complexity and pierce through those those barriers. Well, it sounds like your life is anything but boring. You are an interesting guy, <laughs> that is for sure. All right, one last question. So you inspired me with the question you said you asked Howard Schultz of Starbucks. So let me ask Paul Pagnotto. What keeps Paul Pagnotto up at night? It's impact. How am I going to reach a million lives? How are we going to do that? How are we going to get from point A to point B so that a million people have financial well-being through these standards that we've created. That's what keeps me up at night. A noble gesture, because it sounds like your goals are far more than just continuing to grow Pagnato Carp, but to truly make an impact on the industry at large and the world as a whole. And that is inspiring. This has been incredibly delightful. I am grateful for your time, for your perspective, your wisdom. And I think that you've done a whole lot to really advance the industry and make it a better experience for clients and advisors alike. So we thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for all this time and enabling me to be on your amazing platform with all your listeners to be able to hopefully get this message out. Thanks, Paul. Cheers. I think you'll agree. It's not hard to imagine why Forbes recently recognized Paul as one of their top advisors. His unique journey from NASA scientist to wealth advisor to entrepreneur led him down an extraordinary path of evolution and growth. Not every advisor need make such a major professional leap, but more and more are recognizing the benefits of independence and its impact on the ability to serve clients free of conflict and with complete transparency, as Paul has shared. In our next episode... Matt Oxley of the renowned coaching and consulting firm, the Oxley Institute, joins me to discuss what we call the billion-dollar mindset. We'll talk about the unique traits of those who achieve the highest level of success and how you can adapt those very same habits as part of your own business practices. Matt is smart and interesting, and I know it will be a conversation worth tuning into. I hope you'll join us. Until then... I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for more valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to this series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908 879 1002 or mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note 
that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. Thank you for listening. I also want to thank Advisor Hub for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. Independence.